Hello again, this is Jim Stout Slam Fund. Just going over some more about uh, raw land entitlement. Um, we looked a little bit in the last video on how to find um, some of these opportunities with raw land. It's not, it wasn't definitely not the exhaustive list of how to do it, but it uh, definitely gets you a good start. I really do recommend uh, writing letters and, or knocking on a front door even. Um, and just introduce yourself and find out if they're willing to sell their property. But um, we're going to be talking in some upcoming videos about um, mobile home park infill, how to do that, how to get the, the value of the mobile home park up. We're going to talk about residential developments. I'll probably cover a little bit of it now in this video about tax, tax implications as an investor um, on how far to take the, the project into entitlement and whether to develop it or not, uh, which we do some of both. Um, and then we'll get into, uh, you know, townhome and apartment rental complexes, you know, in some upcoming videos as well. Um, so this video is actually about raw land entitlement and building a team um, to take it through that process. I do not do it all by myself. For sure, I do not. Um, there's a lot of moving parts within it. Um, and between four or five heads, um, you're going to come up with a lot better answer and decision to make than just doing it by yourself and guessing and hoping um, a, a property looks great. You know, one of the things I've seen some properties that just look beautiful from the air, covered in trees, with a little pond in the middle. Um, and then you, you realize when you drive by a cow pasture, it's pretty boring looking. But when you are developing a piece of land, they take out every single tree. I, I love trees. I love the environment. But you, there's code in place. That you have to replace a certain number of trees that you take out. Um, with landscaping trees, or a buffer around the community, things like that, how many trees they have to put on every single home's lot um, are based off of how many you took out. Well, it costs a lot of money to clear 100 acres, 200 acres of trees. So realistically, you kind of want to look for boring looking properties that are already cleared, pasture land or a sand mine, former sand mine or something like that, um, that doesn't have all that foliage, uh, even though it's beautiful and looks great. Um, you know, you want some areas on your property to do that so that you have um, you have a landscape buffers and things like that, nature trails. You know, you want to have some amenities for the community. So you definitely don't mind some clusters of trees, but the less dense, the better for you. Um, so as far as um, building your team, these are some of the people you're going to need. You're going to need um, a company that can do an environmental study, go out and actually walk the property. Um, you pay them money to go out and look for, th th they're used to looking for, for finding uh, eagle's nests, finding tortoise holes, finding potential um, areas that, you know, are more friendly to scrub jays, um, uh, tortoises, um, some types of snakes are endangered. So. Um, they try to go out and flag that kind of stuff for you. You want to get some soil studies done, at least a level one study uh, to find out what kind of soil, you know, they'll do a couple of boring samples, find out what you're dealing with. A level two is if you had a former grove or a gas station used to be on the property, you're going to want to do a level two soil study to find out um, if there's any damage, any contam and contaminants that you're going to be responsible for clearing up uh, because you will be responsible for it, even if you weren't the one that did it. Um, so it's worth putting that kind of effort in. But that same company, typically, um, I like to befriend a, a civil engineer in the area that already has those contacts and has already worked on a lot of projects with those companies and, and can tell me, hey, this these two are really good uh, environmental studies, but I know this guy's slammed with business and he's going to probably take longer. Let's go with these guys. Um, or, you know, this particular surveyor is lot less expensive than the others and for what we need just a quick boundary survey let's go with him but when we get down to platting we want to use these guys so you build your team you're going to need surveyors you're going to need um, soil studies you're going to need environmental studies um, most of that can be if you get a good civil engineer um, you want them to make sure they're staffed well enough that they're not farming out um, the, the actual drafting. Um, you want somebody that's got enough in-house manpower that they're going to be doing the actual designs themselves because it, it'll save you a lot of time in the long run. It, even if they're more expensive, um, it's time is money. And, and, and we had one project that went two years that I was told would only take five months. And it would have only taken five months if I had taken it to a staffed, um, fully staffed engineering company. Um, so 
you know, those are things that you need to look at while you're building your team. And then your civil engineer is going to sit side by side with you at all of the planning and zoning meetings and the council meetings because they know the legal um, engineer, uh, you know, topics and conversations and, and language to, to be able to communicate the answers correctly. Um, you, you, you don't want to just act like you're guessing at what's going to be done on the project when you're talking to the planning and zoning department. If they ask you specifically about the stormwater retention and how it's going to be handled and how the, the, uh, off, the outflow is going to affect the local wetlands if you have some on your property, he's going to explain that a whole lot better than you or I are going to explain it. And that's what you pay him the money for. So um, you're going to be able, you're going to you know, get that team built and then, you know, the actual process is we talked before about making sure your zoning and everything was in place. Um, so if there needs to be um, major zoning changed and, and it might affect the future land use, um, then you've got to do a comp, what's called a comp plan amendment. And that typically goes to the state and it can take a few weeks. They usually will send it to about 10 or 11 departments to make sure how your project would impact um, the comp plan as it is and whether they should modify it for you or are willing to modify it for you. If so, if it goes to the state, that's just another person that can tell you no on your project. So you want to steer away from that. But we've done that before. We've been able to, to uh, sometimes we actually highest and best use was something different than we wanted. Uh, we had one property that was uh, 50 acres, 54 acres, and there was about 60% of it was zoned for mobile home park. So we could have put a couple of hundred mobile homes on it, uh, but we didn't want to um, for that particular community because they had a lot of mobile homes already in the community um, intertwined in, you know, some people built houses, some people built mobile homes. So every other home throughout this entire little town was mobile homes. They didn't really want anymore. So we used that to our advantage uh, to get the zoning that we wanted. Um, and we were ready to build a mobile home park if we had to. So we weren't really bluffing. Um, and we just took it to the council and said, look, we want to do a comp plan amendment change with the state and take this instead of being zoned for mobile home park. Um, but ha but the, the two thirds was zoned that one third was zoned agricultural. And so we said we want all of this to become one PUD, which is a plan unit development. And we kind of write our own ticket for what we want. It was similar to what they had in one of their zoning codes as an R2. It was similar to that, but we wanted 5,000 square foot lots. We wanted 2, 000, uh, 20,000 square feet of commercial, um, and then we wouldn't touch the wetlands areas, and we would stay completely away from those. And there was um, a couple of you know, complimentary things we did to make some of the town people happy, and it actually made the development nicer and better. Um, so, But that was a process. We just basically went in, and, and we had to put put it on the table there was townspeople that didn't want any development there um, but it was zoned for the mobile home park already so it wasn't we weren't asking can we build homes here it was do you want mobile homes or do you want homes and all along we wanted to build the homes so uh, we wanted it zoned for that so we we ended up getting the comp plan changed with the state we got it rezoned as a PUD we got the approval for the lot number of lots that we wanted um, and that process took about a year and a half. And um, we sold that, or I actually haven't sold it yet. We're closing on that in February, um, a few months from now. And that one is uh, almost $11 million that we're selling it for. We bought the land for $1.8 million. I think I mentioned this property in the last video. Um, so there's just some... You need to if you're gonna if you're gonna bluff, you better be willing to back it up. So, and we knew that we would be allowed to do what we did. But once the zoning is in place, now all you have to do is here adhere to the code. So if it's written in the town's code or the city's code, what you're allowed to build, as long as you meet these standards, then nobody can change that. So it doesn't matter once you get the green light and get it approved for the zoning you want. You just have to have an engineer capable of drafting exactly what the code says. Um, and if you do that and meet all the setbacks and meet the buffers for the landscaping and you meet um, street widths and fire hydrants and, and your cul-de-sacs are the right size according to code, as long as everything meets code, you'll get approved. And so that's really what you have to do. And I mentioned, I believe in the last video, that builders don't want to have to deal with that. Builders don't, they want to build houses. So what we do is we do all that legwork for them. We go to dozens of meetings for them, get all this stuff done. 
Um, a lot of times we have the, 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 the land contracted out for sale. Once we know the number of lots we're going to be able to get, we can put it out for sale and we know what that market will bear um, for home. So if a home, it's typically a finished shovel ready lot um, where we're pushing the dirt and developing it is going to sell for about 25% of what a home could sell for in that community. So if it's a $300,000 home that's going to probably be sold in there, then it's a $75,000 lot. Now, they don't necessarily, not all builders have to have it shovel ready. Um, and let me get into the tax implications of this. That's what I was going to talk about. When we do put a, a slam fund deal together and we bring in investors, you're not wanting to pay a whole lot of tax. So what we do is slam fund holdings does not develop the land. We will not ever develop the land. So we'll do one investment pool and say we need, uh, say we've got a $3 million piece of land we want to buy and we're going to need about one and a half to two and a half million. Um, and we need to, typically it's going to be about a little over half of what the land costs um, to get it entitled. Uh, probably a million and a half. So let's say we got five and a half million in the whole deal. So, but if we're going to develop it, you're going to need to put it, put in the roads, put in the stormwater, put it, run all the water lines, connect all the sewer lines, you know, put in all the landscaping, put up the sale, the, the subdivision signs at the road and finish it out like a community with everything but the houses. Um, get the electricity run to all the sites and stubbed off, you know, finished lots, um, there's tax implications to that once you push dirt, you've now become a developer. So we have a sister company um, that's Slam Development Inc. And um, so what we would do as investors of Slam Fund is we would buy the raw land, we would take it through the entitlement process, get it all approved for the zoning that needs to be done, and say, okay, this thing now has permission to be sold as 188 lots. And if we have that, or 250 lots, or whatever it is. We can take that to a potential buyer and say, hey, we have this thing as paper lots finished. You can start the development yourself. We typically would turn over the construction plans. That's one of the things we would have done to get it approved. It has to you know, have the construction plans. And they can look at what it would cost them to push all the dirt, put the roads in themselves, and make you an offer. Now, it's not going to be that 75000 a lot if houses are selling for three hundred to 25% I talked about. It's going to be probably be around half of that. Uh, but we take that is going to take us at least a year to go through entitlement. So now we're looking at a long-term capital gain. You're only paying 20% tax on the profits you make. So if we bought that land, um, let's say we bought 50 acres for $2 million and we put a million into it for entitlement. Um, so we put out 750000 is what we collect from our investors to buy the property at 20%, uh, 25% down on our property. Um, we're going to sell that for probably about 35000 a lot. So we ended up selling, let's see, we got 188 lots out of it. $6.5 million sale um, for paper lots at 35000 a lot. And we uh, only had $3.5 million in it. So we doubled our money in a, in a year to year and a half. That's just a scenario, but that's the typical scenario. Um, if we want to go ahead and sell it, if we don't have a, a, a buyer in place um, for paper lots, then we will sell that to our sister company. Um, so our investors still get their money. We cash them out on paper lots. It might only be about 30000 a lot. Um, but we get it done and get your cash. Um, if you want to roll into the development side of it, um, you can still just roll your investment into that and um, go through the entitlement stage to now create that $75,000 lot, but it's going to cost us a couple million to get to that. Um, but then you're paying income tax. That's now income that you're generating, um, and it'll be in your tax bracket. So we're going to have some, some future videos on how to avoid some of these taxes. Um, in fact, um, when we start talking about mobile homes, uh, parks, and apartment complexes, um, we're going to talk about cost segre segregation, but there's also some uh, conservation easements and things like that. We're going to have one of our wealth strategists, uh, ProVision. Scott Snow is a good friend of mine with ProVision out in Arizona, and they are a wealth strategist, tax strategist company, and I'm hoping to have him on in one of my videos here um, at least if nothing else, a phone interview and have him explain some of these uh, opportunities to eliminate tax completely 
um, and get you down into a lot lower tax bracket before the tax man comes at the end of the year. So anyway, I hope this video has been helpful. I've been known to ramble from time to time, um, but I think this has helped, I hope anyway, um, know that you got to put a team together and get the entitlement stuff in place. And then a little bit about the difference of taking it to paper lot stage, uh, which just means you're approved. You have the drawings ready to go to do 188 lot or 250 lot subdivision or whatever it is. Um, but you didn't actually push any dirt yet. It's ready for someone to push dirt. That's a paper lot. And then a finished shovel ready lot means um, that these builders can go out and start building houses, meaning you put in all the roads and all the infrastructure for them. So two different animals. Um, again, Slam Fund Holdings just does it to that stage for our investors of paper lots. But we we are guaranteeing you a buyer. If if, uh, if we don't have a builder in place to buy those lots, then Slam, Slam uh, Development will buy it and we'll take it to the through the development stage. And you can stay in or get out at that point. Um, so anyway, if you're not already a subscriber, just go ahead and subscribe below if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're watching it on our vlog um, on the website, you already know a lot about us and hopefully you've already started inquiring and looking into our investor portal and looking at some of our past, present, and future uh, investment opportunities for investors. And if you haven't been to slamfund.com, go ahead and visit it. And uh, other than that, guys, I appreciate you listening and I believe we'll get into a little bit more of uh, some of the tax things and things like that coming up. Um, we're going to be talking about mobile home park infill ideas and things like that in some upcoming videos. So continue to watch us. Uh, look forward to learning more about real estate with you and teaching you what I've known or learned over the last 35 years. All right. Talk to you later.